You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Well, about five years ago, I received a very disturbing call from a researcher who was writing a book destroying the reputation of one of my heroes, Manly Palmer Hall just as some previous books have been released sabotaging the work of Helena Blavatsky. I had corresponded with Manley Hall for at least five years in the early 70s, and our correspondence dealt with his books, The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny. Obviously, I have great admiration for Manley Palmer Hall, and uh, I was questioning him on some of the sources and some of his information. I needed information. (laughs) That's right. Well, the researcher in question said he was granted access to my correspondence by the Philosophical Research Society and related that I had caused some embarrassing moments for my mentor, Manly Palmer Hall, and reviewed why I uh, was never given answers to specific questions and why Manly Palmer Hall didn't get to those questions. And when I asked for specifics and my desire to see the question correspondence, the author refused to assist me. And this has gone on for several years, and I have been sadly waiting to read um, that particular work, and I hope it never gets published. However, while waiting to review the planned attack on Manny Palmer Hall, I was greatly pleased to learn of the republication of some of Manny Palmer Hall's most important works, two of which we are going to discuss this hour, first hour. Manly Palmer Hall's The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny with Mitch Horowitz, Now, this hour's guest is Mitch Horowitz, the leading authority on the work of Manly Palmer Hall. Mitch Horowitz is a writer and publisher of many years' experience with a lifelong interest in man's search for meaning. Hot diggity dog. I can't think of a more important (laughs) thing to do in the study our search for meaning. He is the editor-in-chief of Torture Penguin in New York. He is completing a book, which I can't wait to read, called Occult America, The Secret History of How Mysticism Conquered America, forthcoming from Bantam Books. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Mitch. Thank you. Delighted to be here, Bob. Well, I'm so glad you could make it. And congratulations Uh, to you on your book, The United Symbolism of America. I've been reading it and just enjoying it immensely. The research is terrific. Thank you. It's about 40 years' work, as you can probably... I can imagine. (laughs) You see, you know, because, you know, all of us make mistakes. I've made, oh, maybe about 427, and you... Every time you you work on something else, obviously you try to correct those things. But yes, well, I can see a, a great deal of work went into your book, and um, sweat equity is what really matters in these books. You know, anybody can sit around and speculate and spin out theories and spend a lot of time online, but you can really smell it out when somebody has just checked and cross-checked, and I think... That's what you've done in your book, and that's what all of us need to be doing. Thank you very much. Now, Mitch, uh, tell us, who was Manly Palmer Hall? Manly Palmer Hall was born in uh, a small rural city in Canada in the year 1901 in Ontario, Canada. His parents got divorced just around the time that he was being born, and he was raised by his grandmother in the American West. Uh, He spent some time in South Dakota. He didn't have much obvious education. He was sick much of the time as a kid, spent a lot of time in bed, spent a lot of time reading, spent a lot of time around adults because you don't make many friends when you're a sickly, bookish child growing up in the American West. Somehow, astoundingly, at a very, very young age, after Manley had settled um, in the city of Los Angeles, he produced in 1928 a magnificent book that many of your listeners have heard of called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And it is an absolutely magisterial encyclopedia of esoteric and occult philosophy. There's really never been anything like it. It's never been surpassed. And the astonishing thing about it, aside from the quality and the vastness of the book, is that its author was only 27 years old when he published it. And you can pour through this man's life and find no obvious um, earmarks, um, antecedents of how he was able to compile the scale of information that he did in that book. The book is a mystery. The book is a great work. 
and the fact that he was only 27 years old when he compiled it ha- uh, basically uh, uh, elevated him to to a, a kind of a, a legendary proportion in the mind of his admirers. And he was really a very, very great scholar and a man of extraordinary accomplishment. He lived a long life, died in Los Angeles in 1990, produced thousands of books, pamphlets, essays, had an organization in Los Angeles, which we may talk about a little bit. But nothing surpasses the accomplishment of his production of The Secret Teachings of All Ages when he was 27 years old. So I guess you could say that Manley Hall was a great occult and esoteric scholar, but at least as something of a young man, he was, he was a mystery himself. Well, you um, you were involved with the reissuing of this book in a more readable form. I, I haven't seen it, and, and obviously I want to get a chance to take a look at that, because uh, I have maybe half a dozen of Secret Teachings of All Ages all marked up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> except, for, except for the big ones, you know, the ones that... And they're out. expensive, too. You Whoa. can't mark those up casually. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you forget... I always had to have two of every book because one yes. book one book gets decimated, and the other. Uh, but, but his work is extraordinary. This is an extraordinary soul. But but you were involved with having it reissued in a more readable form in two thousand four. Yes, sir. Uh, two thousand three, actually. Actually, two thousand three. We sorry. we call it the Secret Teachings of All Ages Readers Edition. Readers. And and it it just came out of the idea that this very large, somewhat unwieldy book was being owned more than it was being read. Yeah. That, that people would procure it because it has such a legendary status. But the interior design uh, is so dense and, and so difficult on the eye that it, it, it really could serve as a barrier to the reader. So I said to myself, what would happen if we sat down and we completely reset and redesigned this book on a bridge as if we were starting over completely, not to replace the old editions, but to supplement them, to exist mm-hmm. side by side with them. So we we literally reset and redesigned the entire book. We did everything we could to bring very, very high production standards and aesthetic standards to it. This wasn't just a question of scanning something and resetting it into boring old type, but we really tried to give it uh, the kind of epic design that Manley Hall would have wanted but in a way that makes the unabridged text accessible. And we've been through close to 20 reprintings at this point. Holy but, God, yeah, that's it's, great. It's, it's been kind of a dream come true. So I, I feel that we've succeeded in bringing this reader's edition of The Secret Teachings uh, to a, a whole new generation of people. It's one of the most gratifying things I've ever worked on in 20 years of publishing. Well, thank heavens you did it, because boy, I'm telling you, that was one of the biggest problems, was trying to read all of that miniature type. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and of I, I've said to people, it could be like reading a page of Babylonian Talmud. Yes, I mean, that's really, what it was like. Yeah, <laughs> it's that's very right. dense. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, why did um, Manley Palmer Hall believe that the downgrading of all systems of idealistic philosophy, I guess you might say that's more along the lines of the perennial philosophy, yes. and the deeper aspects of comparative religion were such a, a great threat to planetary consciousness? Well, you know, it's funny. When Manley Hall first began working on the secret teachings of all ages, he was living in a time almost exactly like the one we're going through now. He, he completed this book just at the start of the Great Depression. He lived through the 1920s as a very young man, and he saw that American society was, had just become hell-bent on materialism. Procuring money had become the motivating principle of our society to a very great extent. And then the stock market crashed, and everything that everybody believed in, which was material success, seemed to come down around them. And he felt that we as a society, with with exceptions, were becoming ethically illiterate, and that we were downgrading the religious systems, the ethical ideas, the philosophy of antiquity. It was being downgraded by scholars into a kind of very humdrum materialist philosophy that was taking out all the mystery. Manley Hall believed that there was an ancient perennial philosophy that was older than all of our religions, that was older than all of our ethical philosophies, and that saw man's inner development as being the highest aim of life. He believed 
that America was founded as a vessel for that inner development, but that the materialism of our society and the financial crash was blinding us to what we as a nation were really here to do. Not exclusively, but first and foremost. So he believed that idealistic philosophy was dying. His idea of, in writing The Secret Teachings of All Ages and his other books was to try to at least convince a small number of people um, that America's true mission was to serve as a vessel for man's inner development, not for material procurement. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Um, uh, well, he established... Um, well, um, well, he did establish, didn't he, the Philosophical Research Society? He, I know he had help, but yes. I don't, he didn't do this by himself, but this is an extraordinary um, institution. It is. And, and uh, it's just so fabulous. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us about it, please? Well, he, after Manley Hall published The Secret Teachings of All Ages, he kind of became a, a boy wonder of esoteric studies, and he was able to attract a lot of benefactors. He had friends and connections within Freemasonry. He had... Uh, or, or he, he came to develop wealthy benefactors on the West Coast, and he was able to raise enough money to open a beautiful campus in the Griffith Park neighborhood of Los Angeles in 1934. He called this the Philosophical Research Society. It's still there. It's still as beautiful as ever. It is a small Art Deco Egyptian Mayan style campus. It's a self-contained little world with a beautiful library, auditorium, bookstores, some classrooms, a vault where he kept some of his antiquities, many of which have been sadly uh, sold off over the years. But the, the, the Philosophical Research Society is still there. It's open six or seven days a week. Um, uh, it, 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 it has kind of a legendary status within Los Angeles, and people travel from all over the country to visit it. Uh, you know, Manley Hall, he, he had a lofty way of viewing things sometimes. He saw the Philosophical Research Society as being a kind of rebirth of a Pythagorean mystery school. I'm not sure it ever attained that status, but it became a really, really wonderful place for the independent study of esoteric ideas. And there's still a great deal of activity there. In fact, the current president of the Philosophical Research Society, Obadiah Harris, has uh, created a master's degree study program there, which has received state and national uh, um, accreditation. And that was something Manley Hall had hoped for toward the end of his life. So he founded... What, what really endures as, as one of the, the first and the only um, esoteric master studies programs in the country. And it's just, it's a lovely campus. I mean, it, it really looks like something that you're just not accustomed to seeing in this world. The style is uh, Mayan, Egyptian, Deco, and it's, it's quite beautiful and uh, easy to find in the Griffith Park area of Los Angeles. Now, I, that library uh, probably, not probably, I know it has books within it that Library of Congress certainly doesn't have. And, That's absolutely true. And, he, he collected alchemical manuscripts. Um, he collected all kinds of ancient uh, codexes, books of cryptograms. Uh, he had a vault. He has a vault on the premises where he kept a number of antiquities. I've had the blessing to be able to enter that vault. And there are many wonderful things there, but the tragedy is... When Hall died in 1990, the place got wrapped up in all kinds of lawsuits. There were a couple of con artists who had been trying to take advantage of Hall. His widow felt that the organization owed her money, and litigation just went flying. And whenever litigation goes flying, everybody loses, and mm -hmm. everybody lost. Uh, some lawyers got rich, but what happened was the legal debts were just so high after everything settled down. Uh, that the organization was forced to sell off a number of its antiquities to the Getty Museum and to private collectors. So there are books of alchemical philosophy, books of occult philosophy, early printings of the Bible and other sacred works that had once been available in the library and in the vault, and they're, they're no longer there uh, because people went kind of crazy over money. Uh, after Hall's death. It was exactly the kind of thing that he spent his life preaching against. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, the organization is now under very responsible leadership, and they've returned to financial solvency. But those lawsuits took a big bite out of things at the time. What an extraordinary or organization from an extraordinary soul, and I'm certain he's going to be returning in a better package, the way Benjamin Franklin would. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> we can help. <laughs> in a we better <laughs> publication. Oh, but it, well, I'm just telling you, it's just amazing what this man had accomplished. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm just hoping that the the fool who has decided uh, that he's going to be uh, bringing down someone like this is a uh, as I hope the the guy has nothing but bad luck. Well, now I apologize. Like... I apologize for that, friends. Uh, but I, it's the way I really feel. You know, this yeah. is uh, the jealousy, the rage that I heard within this person's voice, the 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 fact that he thought that he had new stuff that that I was. Uh, totally unaware of. I was aware of all that. Manly and I had no problem at all in, in discussing things that we didn't agree on. That's all. And that's yes. any great scholar allows it. It's you know they don't expect you to just swallow what they, what they say. That's right. Manly P. Hall was never afraid of debate. He believed in debate. He believed in transparency, and he also believed that two people could disagree and still be perfectly civil towards one another, still get along, still be colleagues and companions. I don't, you know, the, the problem is people, what was it, Emerson said, every institution is the shadow of one great man. You know, but the people that form around, that form the nucleus around these great men, uh, they want to elevate them to a godlike status. They want to either, you know, project their image in such a way that would present them as a saint, or if they get disappointed in some way or another, they want to, you know, Knock them down like an idol that let them down. Um, but we have to we have to see Manley Hall for who he was. He was a great scholar. He was an independent mind, and I have no doubt that you and he and he and many other people found many many areas where they converged and agreed, and where they disagreed. That's part of what we're here for. You know, you know I we thought, discuss, we debate, we have we have transparency. That's right. Yeah. Well, we got to take our uh, first break here of the hour uh, with our guest, Mitch Horowitz, editor in chief of Tarcher Penguin and editor of the new edition of Manly Palmer Hall's The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny. Go to Mitch Horowitz, H O R O W I T Z dot com. Hello. This is. Stanley Kripner. I'm professor of psychology at Saybrook Graduate School in San Francisco on behalf of 21st Century Radio, run by Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And I would certainly encourage listeners to stay tuned because you will hear things on 21st Century Radio that you'll hear nowhere else on the airways. Mitch Horowitz, H O R O W I T Z dot com. Mitch, tell us. Um, Oh, wait, wait, no, no. How did Manly Palmer Hall see the democratic tradition preserved by secret societies? Well, Manly Hall believed that secret societies were formed um, during the Reformation and in earlier ages to avoid church persecution. He believed that Europe at a certain point um, became almost a kind of religious police state where the church sought to insert itself as an intermediary uh, between the individual and the search for truth. So people with democratic and ecumenical ideas sometimes went underground. They sometimes formed secret societies. They might have called themselves Rosicrucians. They might have called themselves Freemasons. They had some other associations. And he believed that the ideas that these secret societies sought to preserve were not malevolent ideas. These were not conspiratorial ideas in some negative sense. They were very humanistic ideas. They were ideas that extolled the cause of human liberty. And he believed that through the currents of the Reformation and the Enlightenment, a lot of these ideas traveled the trade routes to America and that many of the people who founded this country, he refers again and again to Washington and Franklin, both of whom were Freemasons. Not all, not all the founding fathers were, but those were two associations. That, that through these figures who wrote our Constitution, wrote our Declaration of Independence, you find principles that had gone underground and had been protected in secret societies in Europe during the 1500s, during the 1600s. These ideas and principles, as he saw it, blossomed in America. America was a country that was seen as a protector of religious liberty and of the spiritual search, and that is the secret destiny of America. Yeah, indeed. He was a visionary, uh, and uh, 
he knew about the importance of enlightenment, age of enlightenment, and separation of church and state because many of us would still be suffering from that same particular problem. Uh, now, what was the ad new identity? Because when I say he was a visionary, here's another area in that she was extraordinary. The only person I was reading at the time, about 40 years ago, that uh, said Christopher Columbus has a new identity. Yes. <laughs> and right now we're in the midst of just this information coming out concerning the various code. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, it's extraordinary. I mean, here Christopher Columbus is one of the most formative figures in the history of the modern West, and we can't even figure out his birthday. These people become so familiar to us through the repeat referencing of their name, through their pictures in the encyclopedia, through this exhibit or that exhibit in a museum, that we come to believe, well, we understand, you know, Christopher Columbus, born in Genoa, you know, sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and we repeat these things as if they tell us the whole story. But the fact is, we're not actually sure of Christopher Columbus's lineage, whether he was um, Genoese, whether he was Greek. We're not entirely sure of his parentage. We're not entirely sure of his birthday, of his political connections, of his religious affiliations. There's some scholarship that points to the fact that uh, he might have been a Morano, which is a, a Spaniard of, of Jewish descent who had to uh, hide his Judaism from the Inquisition. Um, there are questions about whether he belonged to some of the uh, secret societies, if we want to put it that way, that we were just talking about. Christopher Columbus is a very unknown man to us. You know, we know the name, and we can identify some of the names of the ships and the dates and so on and so forth, but he is a figure about whom we know very little. Manley Hall in The Secret Destiny of America asks some questions about whether Columbus had imbibed some of these ideas that went underground uh, in Europe, and whether he was much more than a tradesman with a lust for travel, but he was a kind of ambassador of Freemasonic and other ideas of religious liberty that he had hoped to bring to the New World. Now, when you read about Christopher Columbus in The Secret Destiny of America, you know, Manley Hall raises more questions than he does um, present answers, but what he does do he serves a very Hall's writing serves a very important purpose in that it, it it highlights the fact that we actually know very very little about this most familiar figure Christopher Columbus who we learn about from you know grade school on uh, he's a figure of mystery no doubt but um, one of the things that I just loved about his work was his uh, discussion of his cipher of Christopher Columbus cipher and and lo and behold, within recent years, books have come out on the Codex 632 yes. uh, and others, not just that one, but others, which basically have, they claim, um, have been able to, to crack this, this particular cipher. And, and again, Manny Palmer Hall was, was excellent in the area of, of crypt, cryptology and cryptograms and that yes. type of thing. Uh, only a man of that kind of vision. Now, remember, friends, this is 1928. And, and a little later on, in the in the forties, in the thirties, in the forties, in the fifties, when when he revealed a lot of this material, now there are books coming out on Christopher Columbus in China, in yes. fourteen thirty one. Uh, you know, I remember when I first tried to discuss this material with the various professors, and they just <laughs> oh, it's, there's no room for it. <laughs> You can't mention Manley Hall on a college campus. <laughs> oh, I know. And, and uh, you know, that's one of the major reasons why it took a long time for me to decide, well, I think I better work on my Ph.D. Because after after succumbing to all that other B.S., um, uh, and, and undergraduate school, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, yeah. Et cetera then I felt, oh, my God, I don't want to keep learning this stuff. Well, uh, now, uh, Bacon's Secret Society, Sir Francis Bacon's uh, Secret Society, he says, how was Bacon's Secret Society set up in America? Uh, I have the highest, obviously, regard for uh, Sir Francis Bacon and used to own several hundred of his uh, various books dealing with uh, his uh, ciphers and codes. Well, this is probably one of the most controversial aspects of Manley Hall's career. Um, Francis Bacon wrote a utopian parable in the early 1600s called the New Atlantis, and lots of different people embrace this book as as in, some feel that it's a it's a religious vision of God's kingdom on earth. Years ago, people felt it was a, a prototype work of 
socialism, for the kind of utopian economic society man could create on Earth. Manley Hall believed that this was nothing less, Bacon's work, The New, New Atlantis, was nothing less than a blueprint for a society based on liberty and education that Bacon and his compatriots believed could be founded in the New World. Uh, Manley Hall believed that, in a sense, the New Atlantis was a cryptogram. It was a codex. It was a book of symbolism that laid out the plans for the democratic uh, secret societies and philosophies that Bacon and his compatriots, like Sir Walter Raleigh, hoped would unfold in America. Now, Manley Hall's wife... Maria Marie, Bauer? Yes, Marie Bauer. She wrote a very rare book called Foundations Unearthed, and she believed that here in America, in the town of Williamsburg, Virginia, a vault had been created that buried uh, Francis Bacon's manuscripts, blueprints, uh, essentially all of his plans for the kind of great society that would be founded in America. Um, Marie Bauer and her closest followers believed that this Bacon vault could be found on the grounds of a church called the Bruton Parish, which is an Episcopal parish uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, she and some of her colleagues, over a course of many years, uh, conducted occasional digs on the grounds of this Bruton Parish. In the 1990s, a couple of followers of her ideas were arrested and, I believe, prosecuted for trespassing on the grounds of this church where they were conducting uh, what amounted to an illegal dig. Um, the, the Bruton Parish, they're just a, an Episcopal church that sees themselves as in the business of saving souls, and they don't seem to want anything to do with any of this. Mm -hmm. um, but she did write about this and did pinpoint this parish as a place where she felt the Bacon Vault was buried. So that has been the subject of a lot of controversy, some legal action, some charges of trespassing. For me, it's less important whether there is a Bacon Vault uh, and whether anybody ought to you know, go get out a, a map and a shovel and start digging for it. The, the, the point is, Manley Hall believed that you could find within the works of Francis Bacon a vision of a good society and that that society traveled on the trade routes to America. And he believes, again, that, that you'll find within Bacon the, the blueprint for what he calls the secret destiny of America. Well, we're going to take um, our final break of this hour. Our guest is Mitch Horowitz, editor-in-chief of Tarcher Penguin. Hey, I wonder how Jeremy Tar how's Jeremy Charter? You know, he's doing well. He lives in Los Angeles. Um, he, Jeremy Tarcher founded this company in the 1970s. He was a visionary of New Age Publishing, I'll and see, um, yeah. he'll be very glad to hear that you asked for him. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, I remember his coming on our show a couple of times. He did. This was really wonderful. That was about 1988. Yeah. Oh, my God, 21 years ago he joined. Well, oh, well, I forgot what I was doing. we got to get over this break here. <laughs> okay, uh, Mitch Horowitz, editor-in-chief of Tarcher Penguin, <laughs> the editor of the new edition of Manny Palmer Hall's Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny. Mitch Horowitz, H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z dot com. This is George Norrie. Is this George Norrie? Is this you, Robert? Yeah, this is partly me. Also, Bob, before I leave, I wanted to thank you for the contribution you've made to all of us in this country for the format that you've given us for years, way longer than me. And without you around, we wouldn't be the same. Our guest at this time is Mitch Horowitz editor-in-chief of Tarcher Penguin and editor of the new edition of Manny Palmer Hall's The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny, MitchHorowitz.com. Oh, Mitch, no, we, we need another hour to do it. <laughs> I knew it. Okay. it. But, but anyway, we'll, we'll do the best we can with what we got here. Now, there are two questions that I kept asking him about because I, I, I'm a Virgo, and I, I, that's a sickness. I understand. We just like to... <laughs> We like to get things. my mother is a Virgo, <laughs> well, and you know what I'm, you're, I'm talking about. Then, um, you know, you try to get it as perfect as you can. Uh, 
Tell us about the unknown man who designed the American flag. Now, of course, this isn't documented, but I thought it was important. Yeah, you know, this is the kind of thing that Manley Hall would write about in a very earnest and upfront way. And he would say, look, folks, this is speculative history. This is undocumented history, as you said. But he felt that the information should at least be out there so people knew that this was part of the founding mythos of America. Um, there is a book, very, very rare book, that was published in 1890 called Our Flag by a man named Robert Allen Campbell. And in that book, Campbell has what Hall felt was a very, very vivid account of an unknown figure, a professor, a master of ancient manuscripts, cryptograms, mystical philosophies, who befriended Benjamin Franklin and others, other contemporaries of his, and counseled them on the design of the American flag. And then this figure, this character, was lost to history. There was something about the verisimilitude of the account that touched Manley P. Hall, and he, he wrote about it um, many, many years ago. I think he first wrote about it in eight, 1942 in his journal, Horizon. And then he revisited the theme in The Secret Destiny of America a few years later. And the thing I love about Manley Hall is he had the capacity to write about a story like that, this mysterious stranger who met and influenced Benjamin Franklin and was lost to history. He could write about it for four or five pages, say, look, folks, you know, this is just uh, some degree of speculation here, but there's some kernel of intelligence to it, so we're going to talk about it briefly. And then he could just move on. He could just move on. He knew how to distinguish the fine from the coarse that way. So it's an interesting chapter for people to read about. And um, Hall doesn't make any claims uh, beyond what he uh, uh, beyond what material is available to him. Well, um, I I just love those stories, I, and I wanted them to, to be true because yeah. they they just touched my heart. And and I also know, I also know from my limited experience with others. <clears throat> In, in uh, the esoteric tradition, such as Paul Foster Case, yes. and how Paul Foster Case, literally, because I was uh, in communication with his uh, wife Harriet. Oh, that's good. And Harriet told me the story of Paul Foster Case meeting his teacher mm -hmm. in an elevator in New York City. Mm -hmm. Now I know this kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. The reason why I know this happens is because on a much smaller level, my experiences also have uh, taken place up in, <laughs> in New York City mm -hmm. in, in elevators and places like that right out of the blue. I gave a lecture one time that was uh, linked to the United Nations, and before you know it, I'm traveling in an ele elevator with a man who gave me an old old uh, signature of an old Masonic, and I just couldn't believe it. And there mm -hmm. it was. So those things happen. They really do. Yes. Uh, and But, of course, they just sound like stories, and you have no proof for them. But I just love those stories because they, there's another one on the unknown man who swayed the signers of the Declaration of Independence. I almost cried when I read that one because uh, because there are other beings that aren't necessarily physical, and they really could be there. Yes. But no historian's going to accept that. No historian will accept it. And yet these stories are important. I think of them as American apocrypha. They may not be provable, but within them are principles that we feel are true, are mm -hmm. principles that point to something higher. Yep. And I think they're worth reading. Yeah, I do believe that's true. Uh, now, and, and also, with regards to the Great Seal, uh, could you? how is the Great Seal related to the Order of the Quest? Well, you know, I, I very much like the material that you read on the Great Seal in your new book because I think you take a very respectful and, and sober and hard-headed approach to the question of Masonic connections, uh, secret society connections to the Great Seal. And the fact is, there's no direct connection, which I think you point out very well in your book. But there's a philosophical connection that what we see uh, uh, in the Great Seal and that beautiful Latin expression that surrounds it, annuit coeptus novos ordo seclorum, is the idea that a new good society is being born here, and we're wishing for the providence uh, for providence to smile on it. Essentially, uh, the founding fathers um, saw, uh, at least I think, insofar as their idealistic philosophy went, the founding fathers saw the material world as being incomplete without man's inner development, without the blessing of providence. And that, I believe, is exactly what we're seeing expressed on the back of the dollar bill with the incomplete pyramid uh, topped 
by what may be the all-seeing eye of God. It's this idea that the material world is not all there is. What we see is not all there is. We're building a great edifice here, but that edifice cannot be completed without the capstone of something higher. That is a kind of philosophy that ran through the Rosicrucian manuscripts, that ran through the most radical schools of thought that came out of the Reformation, that ran through Freemasonry. It's not an accident that we see that in the ideas of the Founding Fathers. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a situation where we can't necessarily trace down the forensics of the symbol with any certainty, but we can find the philosophical chords that that symbol vibrates to, and that symbol vibrates to the philosophical chords that you find within certain aspects of Rosicrucian writing within the most radical edges of the Reformation. So there's a reason why that symbol attracts our attention. It's, it's a very powerful symbol, and it embodies very beautiful ideas. Well, you did a beautiful job on the front cover of Secret Destiny of America, I mean, and, and putting the reverse of the Great Seal in color against the um, uh, weathered, almost, well, it's another kind of weather-looking, weathered-looking piece of parchment. And I love the spine uh, Thank because you. that spine, again, with the miniature uh, pyramid in the eye and the triangle, in color, uh, just yeah. gorgeous, just gorgeous. I mean, Thank you. there is no, friends, there is no other... Um, uh, when you do, you see the reverse of the Great Seal on the back of the dollar bill, that, in my opinion, is one of the most imp- beautiful etchings of it. But uh, what was done here on the cover of this book is that it was colorized. Yeah. Ah, and it is fabulous. It's just fabulous. And because the guy that obviously designed this uh, particular logo, well, logo, <laughs> our Great Seal, um, Mr. Weeks, he was also a, 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 a Freemason. Now, that's that's... As 1935, that's not the beginning of, uh, of 1782 to 1776, uh, but it's uh, just an extraordinary. I love looking at that spine. I'm sorry I wasted so much time on that, but being an artist, I can't help it. No, I now, appreciate it. I mean, we've really tried to repackage Manly Hall's books as if they're being published for the first time today. Well, he loves this. I can just tell. I mean, he's, he's around. You know he's around. He must have been around you. <laughs> I knock on wood. I mean, I'll tell you, when the complete manuscript of the Secret Teachings of All Ages, uh, we reset the entire manuscript, as I mentioned earlier. When that arrived on my desk, it stood almost two feet high, and just a shiver went through me to feel that I was looking at a book back in manuscript form that was so mysterious and, and such an epic of history and scholarship. Uh, I got a few chills while I was working on that. Yeah, I bet you did. I bet you did. Was, but you know, it's the it's the kind of work that reminds me uh, of uh, some of the experiences of. Um, you sound like one of Sir Francis Bacon's uh, secretaries. I mean, you know how many he had? Yeah, sixty. Yeah. Um, he had, he was <laughs> he was dictating all all the time. Well, okay, I got one more question and. Sure. Um, <sighs> Who was, tell us a little bit about the German pietists in Pennsylvania, because this is another particular topic that, that Manly Hall has uh, opened up for all of us. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, he writes beautifully about the German pietists. I think there's one area where uh, he loses sight of something, but um, to put it in a nutshell, uh, the German pietists were a group of very devout, mystical Lutherans who traveled from the Germanic-speaking regions of Europe that had been just devastated in the Thirty Years' War uh, um, by the by the mid-1600s. And many of these people were people of mystical inclination who fled these very demolished lands that the Thirty Years' War had just laid waste to. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get to the rest of that answer, friends. So you're going to have to get a copy of this book, Secret Destiny of America by Torture Penguin. And thank you for joining us, Mitch. I look forward to reviewing your upcoming book, Occult America. I understand it's going to be be out in September 2009. Yes. It's called uh, Occult America, The Secret History of How Mysticism Conquered America from Bantam. Very unique, unique 
stuff. Congratulations. Thank you, and I'll give the full answer to your question in the book Occult America, which is out in September. Thank you. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Uh, next hour, we'll be joined by James Wasserman to discuss his just-released The Secrets of Masonic Washington, a guidebook to the signs, symbols, and ceremonies at the origin of America's capital, courtesy of Destiny Books. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And remember to sit up straight.